want to? Okay, great. Okay. Uh, Hello. Okay. So, uh, so you already clicked? Yes. Well then. Perfect, thank you. Uh, since I'm the first one, I would like to first thank the organizers for putting this nice uh, conference together, and without further ado, I would like to report uh, on recent work done together with Daniel and with Timo. So the Swamland distance conjecture is surely familiar to this audience. It states that an infinite tower of uh, states becomes massless at infinite distance, and thereby it renders the effective description of a theory invalid. And two natural questions that can arise in this context are, what is the nature of the states that become light, and what kind of theories can we encounter at infinite distance? Um, regarding this, the emergent string conjecture was put forward to refine the, assignment, the statement of the Swampland distance conjecture, and it states that the infinite distance limits that we can have in modulate space are either pure decompactification limits, in which the infinite tower of states uh, is of the kaluza klein type, or emergent string limits, in which the infinite tower of states comes from the uh, tower of excitations of a light string that is critical in some duality frame. Therefore, according to this conjecture, we can either have kaluza klein modes or tensionless strings. And we can hence ask ourselves, is there anything else? Can we perhaps have, for example, tensionless membranes? And this is a particular question that we tackle in our paper. Does quantum gravity impose any restrictions on critical membranes becoming asymptotically light at living parametric scale. And here by uh, critical membranes, we mean those membranes that give you a critical string upon circle reduction. And in our study, we find that the answer to this question is indeed affirmative. These constraints are indeed in place. And we argue so by using arguments of consistency under dimensional reduction of the emergent string conjecture, and also by explicitly studying infinite distance limits in the hypermultiple modulate space of five-dimensional M theory. If you would like to learn more about this work, please pass by my poster later. Uh, this is all my part. Uh, thank you. Oh. Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, so let me also thank the organizers for this nice, op nice opportunity. I'm very happy to be here. Uh, let me get straight to the point. So here's the uh, familiar duality hexagon of uh, superstrings in 10 dimensions, but there's a few extra corners where supersymmetry is broken at the string scale. And the goal is to study infinite distance limits in these orientifold models using uh, D1 brains and the quantum information metric, uh, which generalizes the more standard notion of distance used in uh, supersymmetric cases. And the upshot is that taking some number n of D1 brains, the limits at one and infinity indeed lie at infinite distance, precisely realizing the emergent string conjecture that Raphael uh, told us about. Uh, so here's a picture of what's going on, and for more details you can check out my poster, of, of course. So uh, in the bulk, in the large end limit, there is an effective ADS description, which is uh, weakly coupled, and it features uh, brain nucleation decay. And this can be also understood uh, holographically uh, via somewhat exotic RG flow, and one can compute infinite dis uh, with quantum information distance along this flow, and indeed, one finds that in the, in the large end limit, uh, kaluza klein states become uh, exponentially light, whereas in the opposite limit, which is holographic, there are single trace higher spin currents in the dual CFT description whose anomalous dimensions vanish in the same fashion. And because this only works for these strings specifically, it's really an emergent string limit, and uh, in this sense, membrane limits are, uh, are censored. And moreover, it restores supersymmetry. The supersymmetry is restored in this limit, and therefore uh, opening up the option for a potential heterotic dual frame. Thank you. Uh, hi. So let me go directly to the content because I have uh, much time. So I want to tell you about a tale of uh, two non supersymmetric dedicated magma. This is based on this work with these people, and if you are interested in this, you can also see David Pietos Foster after my talk. So I just wanted to answer two questions, what and how. So uh, we wanted to study some properties of uh, two non supersymmetric dedicated magma. As you know, this is just massive type to a compactify on a Calabria or in default with fluxes. And the point is that in these scenarios, you can have all moduli stabilized at large volume and weak coupling, and there is scarcity variation that uh, you can kind of love it or hate it. 
Andrade, several branches of this backward, beyond the original supersymmetric one that was draped in this paper, and so we will focus on two of them. The so-called non-supersymmetric G4 that has uh, this property compared with to the supersymmetric one, and the so-called non-supersymmetric G2, which has a harmonic component for G2 different from zero. So we want to study the stability and the conformal duals of this vacua. So regarding the stability, this kind of vacua are conjectured to be on the swampland, let's say. Uh, the point is that one can apply a refined version of the weak gravity conjecture that tells you that there has to be some membrane that has that property and it triggers the, the, the stability. So what we have seen is that for the non-supersymmetric G4, uh, G4, there are the D8s that satisfy this property, so you need D6 on the spectrum. And for the non-supersymmetric G2, this is still a uh, work in progress. And regarding the, the conformal duals, this is also interesting because since these backwards say are kind of polemical, so this is interesting because one can learn if they are consistent or not, uh, studying the, the, the dual, the conformal dual. So what we have seen is that, first of all, it was derived in this paper that supersymmetric had always conformal integral inter conformal dimension. For the G4, this is also true, but for the G2, this is not true. So this is all I wanted to say, and uh, thank you for your attention. I have this meme to finish, uh, just some joke. So this is uh, how Twitter uh, looked like if, if instead of uh, Elon Musk, uh, the Swan community had uh, about it. So this is just a joke to finish. <laughs> Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, this recent paper that we put out with my supervisor, Diego Rodriguez, re um, uh, recently. And the question that we ask is, uh, we consider gauge theories based on principal extensions. Uh, this consists of take your Lie algebra, the thinking diagram has some symmetry, and extend your group by this outer automorphism. We had two questions, one from a long time ago, can we build these things in string theory? Another more recent, uh, which, are, which are the generalized symmetries of this? Uh, the second question goes first. Uh, the one form symmetry uh, has uh, Wilson lines charts under it. We found the, which are the topological operators that are generated. Uh, these are these gauge invariant sums of the ones that come from uh, the normal SUN and some nursery level algebra tells you that it's non invertible. Uh, we also studied the D minus two form symmetry, which is a typical C2 uh, D minus two form symmetry that you always obtain when you get a C2. And the reason why this is also relevant for the string theory construction is that uh, the way we know how to build these things are from brain intersections such as this. And the theory on the D3 brain always has a defect, uh, which is the two directions of the oriented fold in blue. And this plays a role that uh, breaks the D minus two form symmetry. These also have fundamental matter uh, that break the one form symmetry. So this sounds a lot like the no global symmetry uh, statement, uh, even though a priori uh, gravity is not there, so why should there be? And this leads me to the outlook that we have. Uh, uh, is this uh, something deep or we just didn't have a good idea to build these theories? And the other question is the presence of this uh, Non-invertible symmetry is usually related to some mixed anomaly. Uh, so, is there is that the case for this uh, outer automorphism? And that's all. And I couldn't bring a poster, so sorry about that. <laughs> okay. Uh, hi, uh, my name is Dowie Gould. I'm a second-year PhD student from the UK. Um, my post was all about two groups. Uh, this is based on work that came out at the end of last year with three excellent collaborators, uh, Fabio Apruzzi, Lakshya Bardwaj, and my supervisor, Skura Schaefer and Amiki. Um, we've heard about two groups quite a lot today already, but I guess there's no harm in me telling you about them again. Um, zero form symmetry is something which has the charged objects are local operators. One form symmetry, the charged objects are line operators extended um, compared to local ones. And a two group symmetry is uh, some structure in your theory where those two symmetries, the zero form and the one form symmetry, mix in a non-trivial way. Uh, in particular, I'll talk about the case where the background fields are dependent on each other in, in some way. You can't turn on one without considering the other. Um, in particular, in our work, we focus on six dimensions, and we'll show that, in fact, there are two groups in six-dimensional superconformal field theories, which is uh, a bit of a workaround from a theory by Cordova, Dumitrescu, and Intrilligator, who argue that you can't have two groups in 6D um, 
with when you have continuous one-form symmetries. We'll look at the case with discrete one-form symmetries. Uh, furthermore, these, these uh, structures in 60 um, admit a classification, and I show some of that on my poster. Um, and lastly, in constructing these two groups in 60, uh, we use some technology that actually doesn't really t rely on the dimension at all. Um, there's a few little details uh, which you'd have to stick in if you want to look at 3D, 5D, 60, but uh, roughly speaking, the, the structure is, is general across dimension, and so I've, I've hinted that too in my poster. So yeah, if any of those things are interesting, uh, please come along and have a look. Thank you. Math is wild. It allows for a lot of pathological examples that tend to challenge our usual intuition. For example, this bias trust function shown here, which is not differentiable at any point and has infinitely many extrema. But we don't expect some function like this to show up in a physical theory. Physics tends to be more tame. It has potentials like this, the KKLT potential, which are nicely smooth and has um, like monotonic behavior when going to infinity. Can we somehow formalize this intuition and use it? Luckily for us, the answer tends to be yes, because some mathematicians have already envisioned a tame topology or geometry, which is constructed exactly in a way to exclude these pathological examples. Then one only uses functions which respect this tame structure, but one has a choice there, so these structures are not unique. An example of these structures, which is quite important, is R and exp, consisting out of the subanalytic functions and the real exponential function. This is exactly the structure featuring in Thomas Tameless conjecture, which states that the potential or the Lagrangian of an effective theory coming from quantum gravity should be definable exactly in this structure. Now, Bakker, Klinger, and Zimmermann have recently shown that geometric periods are also definable exactly in this structure. What we now plan to do in our paper is to show that Feynman diagrams can be expressed in exactly these same periods, and therefore the Feynman diagrams themselves are definable in this structure. This has the interesting consequence that if one starts from a tame Lagrangian, like the tameless conjecture, the loop corrections will respect this tameness. This has many interesting consequences, and I'm happy to discuss these further at my poster later in the poster session. Thank you. I'm going to present some work I did together with Thomas and Damian. So in string compactifications, we are often interested in how physical quantities behave when we approach a boundary in a moduli space. And one way to study this quite generally is with asymptotic Hodge theory. In a nutshell, this provides you with an approximation scheme for things like the period vector in terms of some simpler data that combines in some very rich and non-trivial structure. We also saw this in Alvaro's talk. Now, my research essentially focuses on combining two lessons that we have learned about this over the last year. The first lesson we have learned is that there is, in a sense, an inverse to this procedure. This means that there is a way to recover what happens in the bulk from just this boundary data and some boundary conditions through some bulk reconstruction procedure. Now, this was already known by mathematicians, but I think we were the first to show that this can actually be done in all one modulus Calabiao examples. The second lesson we have learned is that one can actually view a variation of Hodge structure as a special solution to some kind of auxiliary field theory on the moduli space. This particular model is the lambda deformed Westermino with the model. It has all kinds of very special properties, but in this context, I think what is most exciting is that we can ask what is sort of the physical analog of all these mathematical constructions. This is what we are now working on, and essentially we are trying to close this diagram. It's still ongoing work, and so I, I would be happy to discuss this with anyone who's interested at my poster. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I own, I own. I'm Matteo Morito, and in the next few minutes I will briefly illustrate to you my new research work. So as you know, the Volkov-Akurov model, uh, 
whose Lagrangian you can see in the upper part of the slide, plays a central role for supersymmetry breaking in the sense that whenever supersymmetry is spontaneously broken and non-linearly realized, the volkov akulov model shows up. Moreover, Anti-brains are a common ingredient in string theory constructions uh, used to spontaneously break supersymmetry. And once this happens, a Goldstino sector appears on the work volume of the membranes, uh, uh, whose dynamics can be captured by constrained superfields. Uh, the volkov akulov model, which can be uh, equivalently described in terms of a nilpotent chiral superfield, it's the minimal supersymmetric theory uh, uh, that provides a description, a low energy description of a Goldstino. To further motivate our interest uh, in the volkov akulov model, uh, um, <laughs> let me say that the volkov akulov lagrangian contains, besides the, the uplifting F squared term, highlighted in red, um, a four-spinner interaction term, highlighted in green, um, reminding us of the nambu yorona uh, constructions, and then one could be interested in understanding if some strong dynamics or composite states of the Goldstino could appear. Uh, by studying uh, the lower energy effective theory of two chiral superfields X and T, the latter being initially a Lagrange multiplier, uh, via a renormalization group approach, we get the field T uh, acquires a kinetic term, a positive kinetic term, thus becoming dynamical and representing uh, composite states. Uh, then the central critical point uh, corresponding to the original volkov akulov model develops a tachyonic instability uh, due to Goldstino condensations. Uh, the same result uh, uh, holds in supergravity and KKLT is in trouble again. I'm, I have the poster here and I thank you for your attention. Thank you for the opportunity. I'm very excited to be here. Um, I have been working on uh, higher form symmetries together with my advisor Inyaki and uh, our collaborators, who some of which are here. Um, so as it was explained nicely in the previous talks, uh, we can obtain these symmetries uh, systematically and naturally, starting from a string theory, M theory, or F theory uh, via geometric engineering. In fact, uh, this formalism is so powerful that not only we get all these symmetries, but uh, we can learn about the symmetry theory, which tells us about the mixed tooth anomalies between these symmetries, uh, the BF theory, uh, which tells us about the possible choice of global structures, and uh, also we can learn about the higher uh, group structures that these symmetries can form together. Um, and, um, Ha well, uh, how do we do this? Uh, we start from mm, the string theory action or um, supergravity action. Uh, well, if you're interested to discuss more about that, uh, please uh, come to my poster. Uh, I'd be very happy to answer any questions or discuss anything that's interesting and related. Um, for example, we could discuss how can we get uh, non-invertible symmetries or uh, more higher like, categorical kind of symmetries starting from a string theory um, using this symmetry theory perspective, which Federico will tell us about later. Thank you. Oh. Okay, hi. Um, today I'm presenting this work, uh, which uh, is uh, um, about to, uh, to go out in a couple of uh, weeks. And basically, uh, we derived the um, axionic, pa uh, axionic version of the festina lente conjecture, and we were able to do so via dimensional reduction and uh, a geometrical argument. So as you can see, this is the bound that we found uh, for S times F, and uh, it, uh, it becomes uh, um, a window of allowed parameters when we combine it with the gravity conjecture. And since our derivation is uh, based on um, dimensional reduction, we can also find uh, this other window for uh, the volume of the Calabiao and uh, uh, the volume of the cycle, uh, which is giving our axiom. 
So um, indeed, this, uh, this bound, as you can see, since H is the Hubble parameter, this becomes interesting when we consider the inflationary epoch, and therefore we were able to find some consequences on, for example, axiom monodromy and blow-up inflation by imposing this bound on the axioms that are inflating. But also, when we consider this bound today, we were able to find um, another interesting uh, um, prediction on the axiom photon coupling from the connecting mixing. Uh, we also extend this, uh, this bound to n, uh, to the situation of n axions, and make a comparison with the convex hull. And uh, also we try to give uh, um, a gravitational uh, argument, uh, as uh, in the original Festina Lente, but uh, however we were not able to, to actually um, derive the axionic Festina Lente purely from uh, gravitational arguments, so um, we only have this, uh, this uh, geometrical derivation, which however is uh, um, quite interesting, so if you want uh, to discuss uh, these, uh, these uh, predictions, come to my poster and I will be very happy to um, discuss this with you. Thank you very much. Oh. It changes here on the screen. Ah, uh, okay. So now we have to get um, so that is no. Nope. That's fine. That's yours. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. Does it work now? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So Okay, so as Ling told us earlier, you can represent 61,0 SCFT as general S quivers. And in the case of type A quivers, you have just a, a plain hypermultiplet with two SUN gauge group. So by chaining them together, you can, you can create a gauge invariant operator like the one on the top right. And the point is that you can uh, understand this linear, linear quiver as a uh, linear structure as an open spin chain. For instance, if I focus on the, the scalars inside the hypermultiplet, uh, I can say that if I have only x's, I say that they are all spin up. So that's a protected operator. I know it's conformal dimensions. It's conformal dimension, but if I start switching x for y's or equivalently uh, flipping the spin, this is no longer protected, so I have uh, an, 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 an anomalous dimension, uh, and in principle, I, I, I want to compute it, and if the quiver is, is long enough, I have an expansion parameter, so I can actually start computing things. And if you shake the dilatation generator, which encode that anomalous dimension long enough, you will find that it's an integrable Hamiltonian. So I have access to all the, the technology of integrability, in particular the better ansatz, to extract all the conformal dimensions. And on my poster, I have several generalizations, like what happens if I just take not scalars, but also fermions and derivatives. And you can see me at my poster. Hello, I'm Roberta Angels. I want to talk on this paper, appear in Arxiv on Mars, and realized in collaboration with Jose, Matilda, Jesus, and Angel Uranga about dynamical cobordism to nothing. Cobordism conjecture say that the cobordism group of a consistent uh, d-dimensional quantum gravity theory has to be trivial. A topological implication is that any quantum gravity theory admits a configuration and in space time. In the paper, we study realization of such configuration following an effective field theory approach in string theory. They are given by space time running solution of a d dimensional Einstein gravity coupled to scalar. 
and showing a singularity at a finite distance in space-time, at which scalar go to infinity. We call end of the world brain source for such singularity in this effective approach. Uh, in the paper, we show that there exists a local universal description of the theory and its solution near the end of the world brain, controlled just by a critical exponent. We get an exponential potential dominating in this regime, logarithmic profile for scalar field, and some suitable scaling relation for space-time curvature and distance from the singularity in terms of the distance in the field space. Different examples are treated in the paper. For more detail, you can look at the poster in the next session. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I want to tell you how to count BPS states that carry discrete charges in five-dimensional M-theory vacuum. And uh, this is one of the results of a paper that I uh, submitted last year or published now. And uh, what I want you to think about is you start with a smooth Calabi-Yau threefold in M-theory such that you get a continuous abelian uh, gauge symmetry and then you go to a special value in complex structure moduli space, a special locus where this degenerates. You develop nodal singularities and you develop them such that they cannot be crepantly resolved while preserving calarity only in an analytic fashion. And F-theory has shown us that M-theory tends to develop Z and discrete gauge symmetries in this situation. So the typical example I want you to think about is the singular Jacobian vibration of a smooth genus one vibration. And the question is, how do you count the multiplicities of Z n charge BPS states? And uh, what I use is that in this situation you can turn on a fractional B field that stabilizes the singularities. And this essentially brings you in the realm of what is called non-commutative resolutions of spaces. And I claim that if you take the topological string partition functions of these non-commutative resolutions together with the original smooth geometry, you can extract Zn charge Gopakumawafa invariants for these vacua. And in order to obtain the uh, partition function on these non-commutative resolutions, I use the fact that there always seems to be a complexified Kähler deformation to another smooth Calabi or threefold that in this F-theory example is just the smooth genus one vibration. So the upshot is you can study topological strings on non-commutative resolutions. They are very interesting and they are necessary in order to calculate discrete charge Gopakumawafa invariants. And since I have a little bit of time left, there's also a beautiful interplay with the modular properties relating this, whoop, this partition function and that via Fricke duality. And a given Calabiao admits a Zn refinement for every such gen degeneration, so many of such in general. Thanks a lot. Okay, so uh, hello everybody. I'm going to present, uh, uh, no, not this one. <laughs> okay, yes. Oh, yes, this is, okay. I, I'm going to present uh, um, a joint work with uh, Andrea San Giovanni and uh, Roberto Valandro, but also see please the, some paper that uh, we published in collaboration with uh, Andres uh, Colinucci, one also recently in a uh, few, few, two weeks ago. Okay. okay. <laughs> And uh, okay, so basically we study M-theory geometric engineering. <laughs> we study M-theory geometric engineering on uh, terminal triple singularities. Uh, these engineers rank zero five-dimensional superconformal field theories. And uh, we uh, gave a, novel, a new method to study them and to study the characteristics, the features of these uh, superconformal theories that applies also for non-toric uh, singularities. And uh, in particular, the idea behind this is that uh, uh, these uh, terminal three four are, uh, uh, are non-trivial AD vibration, deformation of uh, AD singularities. And uh, we recover the physics of the five-dimensional theories from the physics of the trivial vibration that gives uh, a seven-dimensional gauge theory. So we use this gauge theoretic approach. And uh, in indeed, we have uh, 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 very, very much control on the physics of the 5D th theory, and we built uh, a dictionary between uh, 7D quantities and five-dimensional quantities. That is very precise, you can, uh, okay. 
Uh, in particular, in this, uh, in this last paper, we stu study, we apply it uh, uh, because uh, actually the method is very automatizable and we, uh, we have some codes uh, to study this kind of uh, singularities and we basically uh, study all the, the so-called quasi-homogeneous compound of all and uh, we got the refined data such as uh, uh, the action of uh, flavor symmetries, explicit action or uh, discrete gauging symmetries. We uh, always found uh, from the complex structure of viewpoint free hypers or discrete gauging, and that's it. And, okay. <laughs> and uh, I have a poster there, so please ask me later if you want. Thank you. Okay, thanks a lot. Uh, so I'm very happy to be here and thanks a lot for the opportunity to present, uh, not necessarily my work, but I wanted to sort of give a, a big picture overview of some of the research that I'm interested in, uh, because I've noticed typically in two minutes, I find it very difficult to get like a sharp point across about a particular paper. Um, and also I'm a bit too jet lagged to focus. <laughs> so uh, I'm going to tell about two things, which is my world line and my research. Uh, so my world line uh, started, I guess, academically in a town not too far from here uh, at the University of Amsterdam, uh, where I mostly worked on string cosmology and quantum gravity. Uh, so then I moved to the US uh, to pursue a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin Medicine. And also there I became very much interested in trying to understand the swampland and especially trying to understand how the swampland intersects with cosmology. Uh, and then actually this fall I will moving uh, to Arizona State University as a Heising Simons Fellow. Uh, so that's part of a new collaboration that has been uh, started called the Curious Collaboration, uh, which has the goal to understand sort of if quantum gravity can lead to particular signatures, and if you can also actually observe those signatures. Uh, so sort of the two big things uh, that I, I like to work on are sort of these swampland constraints uh, and trying to understand cosmology and quantum gravity. So some of the things on the swampland side that I've worked a lot on is the weak gravity conjecture, uh, so some work that I've done is trying to understand the so-called mild form of the weak gravity conjecture, where we try to understand how high derivative corrections, how those uh, correct the extremality bound of extremal black holes, and also trying to understand how that can be related to energy conditions in quantum gravity. Uh, and the sort of more on the cosmology side, uh, I'm very interested in trying to understand sort of how to uh, formulate quantum gravity in a cosmological space-time, which I think is a very important problem. Uh, and in particular, I've worked on low dimensional de Sitter space. So for example, Jackie Tidebone gravity and trying to understand, for example, how can that be related to particular models of inflation and can we understand quantum gravity and its observational features? Thank you. Hello everyone, uh, today I'll talk about uh, Twisted Elliptic Li General based on a joint work with uh, Kia's colleagues Kim Yong Li and Xin Wang. So uh, for the last uh, 10 years, uh, uh, 60 1,0 SFTs have been uh, extensively studied uh, both on classification and uh, partition function. For example, the first relation chain uh, is well established by now, uh, involving both uh, geometry engineering, circle compactification and uh, the elliptic general of uh, 2D 0, 0,4 SFTs of uh, BPS strings. So in recent four years, to classify 5D SFTs, uh, people started to uh, study the twisted uh, circle compactification of 6D SFT. And uh, uh, so this can happen when the 6D SFTs have uh, uh, discrete global symmetry, for example, when the 6D gauge algebra allows uh, alter automorphism. So uh, in such case, uh, the twist uh, is classified by twisted affinity algebra, and uh, uh, and uh, in those cases, the the elliptic calabial are generalized to local uh, genus one fiber calabial, and the uh, elliptic general are generalized to twisted elliptic general. So uh, we began to study this uh, twisted elliptic general for all uh, rank one twisted series. So because this uh, 
uh, on partition function level, it's uh, not uh, well studied yet. So we, we started from three approaches, twisted elliptic bluff equation and modular property and uh, spectral flow symmetry. So for more details, please come to my poster. Thank you. Good, uh, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thanks uh, first uh, for the pleasure to have the whole community here again and uh, present some work, uh, which we are about uh, to finish with Michele Di Zotto, Mu Yang Lu, and uh, depending how good uh, the conference goes, uh, it might also appear next week. And um, so what we are considering in this work is uh, something we have not talked about so much in this uh, conference, uh, which is not an SCFT, which is not a supergravity theory, but it's a little string theory in 60. That's like the, uh, the little friend which sort of sits in between of them because uh, it doesn't have gravity, but it has a scale. And, uh, and that's very good because uh, if it has a scale, you can t-dualize it. You can uh, construct t-dual little string theories. And what that means is, for example, if you do geometric engineering, like uh, your f-theory, for example, and uh, you compactify and get a little string theory A, and uh, you reduce in a circle, you have a, a little string theory B, and you can uh, uh, you uh, put that on a circle, you get a 5D theory that is uh, the same, up to uh, some uh, flavor holonomies, maybe. And uh, what this means in the geometric engineering picture that an M theory, you should get the same M theory geometry, or you should get M theory uh, geometry X, uh, B and X A, which is birational to each other. And uh, that's exactly essentially the name of the game uh, that we used in order uh, to construct these theories. And uh, the result of this is essentially that we extended some work uh, by Aspen von Morrison that you, uh, for example, construct little string theory with some flavor symmetries uh, like E8, uh, that probes some uh, n instantons that are gauged by some gauge group G. You should think in this, uh, in this quiver kind of way that you have seen before and, uh, and extend uh, via the conformal matter. And that you can essentially t-dualize this to the spin 32 uh, little string theory. But the point of our work is now that you're able to uh, deform via some holonomies this uh, E8 flavor symmetry to other ones uh, and map it over to the SO32 side. And uh, what you can then do, and what we did, is you can match many, many things like Coulomb branches, two group structure constant, and uh, find many more other things. Good, yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so good afternoon. Today I'm going to talk about as the result of Paul's uh, techniques on the F-theory geometry of the unconcurrent Calabios to present the uh, TDR system we identified with 60 uh, string theories. Yeah. So, so we noticed that uh, this work is motivated by the two groups structures that identified in the little string theories. Means that the so-called kappa is the two group structure constant that controls the mixing of the zero form globe symmetries, including R symmetries, Poincare symmetries, and the, the global flavor symmetries, talks to the U1 um, one form symmetries in the little string theory. And we propose that if different uh, electric vibrations in the perspective of F theory, they have the matchings of the row three uh, series of the structure constant, as well as the dimension of the column branch, and also the rank of the flavor symmetry, then after circle reduction, they map to the same uh, 5D theory. So those two group structure constant obtained from the tensor branch data, so that's the formula. And in practice, we employ the F theory constructions to get the geometries of the Calabial uh, threefold, such that you can get the direct pairing matrix and the all rows data. So here is the part of the TDRT theory we verified so far. And you can see that from the exceptional frame that we decorated the theory with M copies of conformal matter. And this M value controls the rank of the gauge node in the quivers of the TDR series. So I'm more than welcome to the questions in the, that, that's it. This was the answer, this was the end. I thank uh, especially all the speakers for staying within the time limit. Uh, and uh, let's thank all the speakers once more. <laughs> and then, there are many, many of the
the posters, you can see uh, the posters are there and uh, uh, located here. So please uh, have a look and interact with them.